morning, everyone. So good to see you here. Many people here today. Wow, that's great. And those of you who are online watching as well, thank you for being here. Well, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord because it's a day that He has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it, right? I heard that person online, right? All right, yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, about six or seven years ago, six years ago maybe, I began a, a little project of having um, people who were in full-time ministry or who had been uh, in ministry in some capacity uh, to come back uh, uh, to this church. If this was their home church, or a number of people from the youth groups in the, from the 80s, um, graduated from high school, went on to either ministry training or um, discipleship training, and then went out into full-time or volunteer ministry positions, and, and I made it a point to try to invite all of them back to preach. Uh, there was one by the name of Moore. Uh, there was uh, uh, just a number of people that came back. A ringer had actually came back as well uh, and led in worship for him. Um, and Katie Graham Langdon now... Um, we had been trying a number of times just to organize schedules. She was living in Hamilton, her and Jay, and, and just, just trying to connect it so that she could be here on a Sunday to lead in ministry, um, and it just it never worked out. She led for about three uh, women's retreats, I think you participated, um, but we finally get her here on a Sunday morning to lead us. So it's, I'm glad to have you. The Lord... Uh, has certainly blessed her and her ministry to just to be able to connect uh, he and us. So allow her as she leads you um, to, um, to connect with God. Uh, find that place in your heart where even this, despite the fact we can't sing, there's still the soul inside of you that's reaching out and ministering. Father, we thank you for this morning and just pray that every part of this service would be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my soul. 
soul worship his holy name
are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations, for your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. I said to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. Oh God, listen to my cry, hear my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I cry out to you for help. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the towering rock of safety, for you are my safe refuge, a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. Let me live forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. Show me the way of life. Grant me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth.
laid beside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lord. the blood apply thank you Jesus it has washed me white thank you Jesus you have saved my life brought me from the darkness into glorious light
what it feels like. We've just walked out of the wilderness. And we're coming into a brand new day. God, as we come into the place of intercession, the place of petition, the place of asking and seeking for ourselves and on the behalf of others, Lord. We do it with grateful hearts, Lord. Just so thankful, God. Just so grateful for who you are and how much you love us and that, Lord, you've never given up on us. Your kindness and your love is so amazing. Lord, we come this morning and we want to worship you with our prayers. We're so thankful for the prayers that have been answered, for the miracles that we've seen, for the healings that we have witnessed, for the people who've been set free, those that were in bondage, Lord, those that were lost, that we've seen come to truth and to a knowledge of who you are and what, how much they need you. But God, there's still those on our heart that we bring to you this morning, Lord, that are hurting. Lord, those that are grieving. We think of Ernie, Lord, and we, we just ask you to continue to comfort him and his family, Lord, in this time. Lord, we think of Lord Matt Vaders and we think of Joanna Savage, Lord, and Jason Wright and God Shelley Moore. Those, oh God, there may be those that we haven't mentioned, God, but Lord, they're in our hearts as well because, God, you know who they are. And, Lord, we're just coming to tell you that, Lord, this morning, our trust is in you. God, we thank you for doctors and for technicians and nurses and all the caregivers that do the very best that they can with the science that they understand. But, God... Our dependence is not upon them. Our dependence is upon you because we are believers. We are followers of Christ. And we believe that God healing is the bread of your children, Lord. And so we come this morning and we believe. And we, as we ask, Lord, we do it with faith in our hearts, believing that, God, you will meet their need. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we come this morning as well. And we pray for the leaders of our nation, God. We pray for all those, the politicians, and all those in the medical field, Lord. Lord, we pray for those at the local and the national level. And Lord, we pray for those, Lord, who are in business, and Lord, all of our spiritual leaders. We ask you, God, that they would be seekers of wisdom, that they would look to you, God, where there doesn't seem to be answers and everything seems to be a moving target in our world today, but God, that they would seek wisdom and you would, we know, God, you're faithful you're faithful to answer our prayers and, Lord, to give them guidance, good, sound strategies, Lord, to lead, to lead our nation, to lead people out of a pandemic and into health and wholeness. And for our spiritual leaders, Lord, 
to lead us in the ways and the knowledge of God. Lord, not man's ways, but God, your ways. Lord, would you give our spiritual leaders of our land, Lord, would you give them your thoughts that are higher than ours? Would you help them, God, to lead the people in the ways of God? That our steps would be ordered of you, God. We thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we pray for Lanark County. We pray for a move of your Holy Spirit. We pray for an outpouring, God, like we've never seen before. That, God, you would move upon this, this county. And, Lord, you would move upon the people. Lord, that there would be hearts that would be broken before God. That there would be, Lord, acknowledgement of their need for you. That just like us, God, God, I remember how lost I was. I pray, God, that you would, Lord, just have people understand how lost they are without you. And that, God, there would be just such a move of your spirit that, God, men and women and children in this county would just come to the knowledge of Christ and would yield their hearts, yield their lives, yield their opinions, yield their thoughts, yield their plans to you, God. Oh, God, we thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we know that your word says, Lord, in Proverbs, that finding wisdom is finding life. That finding wisdom is finding blessing. And finding wisdom is finding the favor from the Lord. But rejecting wisdom, a person who rejects wisdom wrongs his own soul. God, that's your word. And so this morning, Lord, we pray that as pastor brings the message today, that we would humble ourselves. We would yield ourselves enough to receive the instruction of wisdom, God. God, there's no shortage of opinions of man in this world, but God, we need truth. We need truth to impact our thinking so that, God, we don't get taken down a road of deception. So, God, never before like it is in the world today. Lord, the spirit of Antichrist has just been released. And there's just so much darkness. But, God, we don't curse the darkness. We are the light. And we, God, bring your light to people. Lord, we want to be a people that move in the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to be a people, oh God, that are full of light and full of you. So God, we humble ourselves this morning and we just acknowledge that we don't know it all. Lord, we want to be spiritually mature so that we can not only hear your voice, but we can receive understanding, insight, and revelation to know what and how to act on what you say. Lord, we want to be used by you in this hour. So we pray this morning for Pastor Lewis, Lord. We pray for the Holy Spirit to work in him and through him and that our hearts would be open. Our ears would be tuned to your spirit and we would be willing to receive what you have to say to us, God and that we don't know it all. 
Thank you, Father, for loving us so much. Amen. Thank you, Gail, for leading us in prayer, Lydia and the Word, and for Katie in worship. Thank you. Just before I uh, jump into the message, um, I want to thank you for, for being so faithful in your giving. Um, you have been so, um, so good in your discipleship, stewardship to the Lord. So thank you very much through this uh, past year and a half where we've been um, doing our best to empower and equip you as a church. Uh, God bless you and thank you. Also, we, we have a fundraiser for our, our community projects that we do through our missions department. And uh, every year we, we do this garlic fundraiser. Well, uh, Karen has some um, harvested from a number of places, I guess, some great garlic. And uh, you just needed to contact her before it's all gone. Last year, people were uh, actually, someone, Karen told me this week that someone actually ordered garlic right away because they missed it last year. So if you need some garlic, uh, see Karen. Um, we also need some technical people, some projectionists uh, to help out on Sunday morning. It's very simple work, and you need to see Lydia for that. And also VBS is coming up in August. It's coming up real soon. And uh, if you've received the mailing uh, you can do, uh, you could respond to that and, and connect with Pastor Nathan. He needs to know who's registered so that he can send you the proper, uh, the proper materials, I guess. Uh, and even to help encourage you if you want to do it at your house for your neighbors or uh, your grandkids, uh, nieces, nephews, whatever. So please uh, take advantage of that. And lastly, just, you know, De December's right around the corner. You know, we usually do that December uh, shoebox drive. Well, you know, maybe you can even just start stocking up now on things that you can put in your shoeboxes, uh, spread it up over the summer and the fall, and uh, be ready for when the shoeboxes come. All right, last week, I taught that Satan opposes us. So many different levels. He opposes God building character in us. That's just what he does. And I concluded by talking about how Satan uses footholds in our life to oppose us. So this morning, I want to address the question that I left you with last week. And that is, can believers be demonized? So let me unpack that a little bit. When Satan gets a foothold in someone's life, a place where he can securely advance in that person's life, uh, there, there are a lot of preachers and teachers on this subject, and they all call that being demonized or being oppressed by the devil. Now, before I go any further, please, um, this is the type of teaching that I know most people are going to say, hey, well, that's not for me, it's not about me, uh, pff, demons, no way, uh, I'm not into that, they're not into me, uh, you know, um, and, and yes, and amen, and that's good. Um, but I, I want to help us understand it a little better, because it is really important in the life of a Christ follower. Okay, so keep an open mind, right? Got it? First, let me, before we go any further, answering this question, let me define what demons actually are. What are demons? Well, Scripture describes demons as spirit beings who are unclean, immor immoral in nature and activity. Okay, so they're not good. And, and I think most of us get that from, you know, movies like Friday the 13th and all that stuff. You know, like we, we understand demonic ideas. 
But understand that this is in Scripture where it explains that demons are real. Much like I've been saying the last few weeks, uh, that the spirit realm is real and, and, and the devil is trying to do everything he can to oppose us, we need to understand the role of demons in all of this. Demons exist in complete and constant opposition to God and anyone who sides with God, anyone who calls themselves a Christ follower. And they have power, as we learn in Scripture, to afflict people with disease and even worse, with spiritual illness or sickness. And here's some of the things that the New Testament teaches us about uh, demons. Like, for instance, from James 2, we learn that they themselves believe in the power of God and tremble. Matthew and Luke teach us that they are able to recognize that Jesus, while he was on earth, was actually the Son of God. They acknowledge the power of his name when used against them in exorcism. Uh, demons, even according to Matthew 8, Jesus' words, they, they actually anticipate the judgment that is coming upon them. And if, if you would, they are similar in nature to angels in that they have knowledge and powers, but they are exactly opposite in that they oppose God and work against anyone who calls themselves by God's name. So put in basic terms to define what are demons, uh, they are angels, if you will, of Satan, who are bound to do his will and his bidding to counter God. Okay, that is what a demon is. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about the world and how the emphasis of what the world is and who influences the world, bear that in mind as we work through here. So next, let me just describe, secondly, let me describe to you what being demon-possessed actually is, okay? I need to just ease your minds and, and help you understand that there's more than likely, actually, I'm pretty positive, no one in this room who is demon-possessed, and, and probably no one listening at home either. I can say that without, uh, without any doubt at all. What a demon-possessed person looks like is, is not, not, and again, not someone who is demonized, uh, influenced by demons, or oppressed by demons, but someone who is actually in, uh, possessed by a demon. Now, the word possession, let's just break this down further, implies that something has taken over something else. Something possesses something. So Satan possesses a person, the very core of our human personality. The Gospels give us five stories where Jesus actually interacted with and exercised demons. And then there's another six stories just in the gospel. Now, this is the, besides the Old Testament and the rest of the New Testament. There's another six stories in the, new, in the gospels where the disciples or Jesus were um, uh, confronted demons or he gave them power to confront demons um, and, and they're only mentioned in passing. So they are real and they are acknowledged in Scripture. And they in these cases, these 11 cases, possessed people. And one of the greatest stories in the New Testament um, is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, where we get a real vivid picture of what a demon-possessed person looks like. Now, this is not, again, this is different. Uh, it, it's not your middle of July encouraging spiritual uplifting sermon. You're going away from church saying, wow, we learned about demon possession today. Uh, okay, so just bear with me as we go through this, but it is really important to understand uh, the differences between demon possession and demon oppression or being demonized. So let me just tell you this story. Um, it's an account of a man that was living in the region of Jerusalem. Okay, now he was um, 
uh, he was called Legion. He told Jesus, when Jesus asked who his name was in Luke chapter 8, uh, he told Jesus that his name was Legion because they were many. And actually, in Roman times, a legion was defined as 300 to, or sorry, 3,000 to 5,000 Roman soldiers. That's what uh, the definition of legion was back then. And, um, and these are the following details that Luke and Mark specifically uh, show that, that paint a really good picture of someone who is demon possessed. And again, as I go through this, you'll, you'll notice that there's no one here in this room like that. This person nor wore no clothes. This person didn't live in a house. They lived in graveyards. This person had been kept under guard and bound in chains, but yet broke out of chains that they were constantly bound to. They were driven into the desert. No one seemed to be able to subdue them. There was a little girl whose parents couldn't help. There was a little boy whose parents couldn't help. And, and this particular guy was not able to be bound or subdued by anyone. A night and day, it says in Mark chapter 5, that this person cried out and actually cut themselves with stones. So that's just a little snapshot, a picture of someone who was fully possessed by demons. Now we know there were many demons in this man because uh, he identified himself as legion. And at the request of, um, and at their request, Jesus sent legion into a herd of pigs, about 2,000 pigs, Mark tells us. And so the demons left this man, went into his herd of pigs, ran down a hill, and drowned in the water. Now, that pig farmer lost a pretty substantial portion of their um, herd that day. But those, or that was, a fully executed exorcism by Jesus on this man who was fully possessed by a demon. So, let me just say this. Exorcism is real, despite the movies that have been made popular over the last 40 years. Exorcism is real, and it is dangerous, and it should be referred to those Christ followers who are experienced or gifted in this area. It's real. It's dealing with satanic influence that has possessed a human being. So that is what a fully possessed demon might, demon possessed person might look like. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? It's pretty out there. Okay, what does it mean to be demonized or to be oppressed by a demon? It's not the same at all as demon possession. I believe as Christ followers, though, we need to realize that this is much more prevalent than we think. Demonization is when a demon invades one area of a person's life, Christian or not. Demons don't just attack Christians. See, one of the keys of understanding the battle that was won on the cross is that Satan hates God. Satan wants to do everything to destroy, to trample, to, to hurt God. And one of the ways of doing that is hurting the crown of God's creation, human beings, people made in his image. And so, Satan will try to oppress or demonize anyone. And if you look back to last week, that's how the world, as we define it, gets its shape and personality from the influence of the enemy. Okay. So, I think I can go right to the top here. 
Can believers be demonized? The answer to the question is yes. Christians and non-Christians can be demonized or oppressed by demons. And for the sake of this message, we're going to let both those terms, we'll interchange both those terms, demonized and oppressed. So basically, a Christian can be influenced by a demon. Now you're saying, okay, tell me something new, I knew that. Okay, just work with me here and listen. Remember Jesus turned around one day and spoke to Peter, who's one of his disciples, who's been working with him and living with him and listening to his teaching and growing with him and understanding him. Jesus turns around in Matthew 16 and he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Okay, I, you know, in my mind, I think Peter's a pretty good person. He's a disciple, you know, like I know. He was a little impulsive sometimes. But There were areas of Peter's life that had not been fully conquered yet as he was growing as a disciple. And likewise, there's parts of my life and your life as Christians that we are not yet freed from. The sin nature still opposes us. Now, I've talked with many people in my office over the years as pastor, um, and, and this is one of the hardest things for Christians to say, admit, or even believe that they can be oppressed or demonized, because they're good people. And, and each of you and I, all, we're good people. And, and sometimes people have even said, well, yeah, I, that's just the way I am. Maybe I tell people the way it is, and you know, I'm, I'm just that way. I'm, I'm not perfect. Excusing the fact that maybe there's something below the surface that's happening that Jesus wants to deal with, that Jesus wants to help them overcome. So, there are people, and, and yeah, so you'll probably say, okay, me too. There are people who seem compelled to act in certain ways that are contrary to their innermost desires. You ever been there? You just, something happens and you do it a way that you didn't really want to do it. We are not possessed by a demon. We are influenced by Satan and his angels. There's areas in our life that are influenced. Wouldn't you admit that there's probably outlying areas in your life that have not yet been fully given over to Christ and His Lordship and conquered by the power of the Holy Spirit from the work that Jesus did on the cross? 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says this, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Come from the Father, or come not from the Father, but from the world. Now, those three things are the three vices in life, sex, money, and power. The three things that Satan will use to get into every one of our lives. He'll use one of those three or all three or two of those things to get in. He even tried that to Jesus in the desert. He tempted him with the lust of the flesh. Turn these rocks into bread and you'll eat. You'll have all the physical needs you want. And he says, look at the lust of the eyes. I'll bring you up to the top of this mountain. You'll see the splendors of the world. I will give that all to you, materialism. And then he even said, here, throw yourself down from here. You won't get hurt. You are godlike. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Satan will use those to hurt, oppose, to tear us down. Now, significantly, John uh, warns us to not pretend or to claim that we do not battle with sin even though we are Christ followers. Uh, 1 John 1, 8 to 10 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is just not in us. 
And this is a guy who wrote this, but he walked with Jesus for three years. He knew and he understand this truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. To some extent, all Christians, all Christ followers have not surrendered every area of their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's where Satan will come in and try to demonize you. If you need someone else to compare yourself to, uh, we could always compare ourselves to Paul. You know, we're saying, well, you know, I'm not that, you know, no, this demon thing is not something. Well, let's, let's just look at what Paul said when he said in Romans 17, and I referred to this last week as well, Romans 17, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. I know, none of us are there, right? But this is the great apostle Paul writing these words. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. He's not writing to non-Christians. Finally, if that's not enough, Jesus has some words for us in John chapter 8. Jesus said this to believers. He said, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and, and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Okay, now this verse, you, or these verses, we really need to just understand a bit. First of all, understand, to the Jews who had believed in him, these are Christ followers. These aren't the Pharisees and the ones who rejected him. These are people that believed in Jesus' teachings. He told these believers that everyone who sins is a slave or in bondage to sin. And the verb sins is a as verbs are action, it is an ongoing action. It's a continual action in the original languages. Other translations of Scripture, this is the New International Version, but other translations say that like this, everyone who practices sin or everyone who commits sin, everyone who sins is a slave, signifying an ongoing action. So Jesus didn't mean someone who had once sinned. He's talking about an ongoing, an habitual, a continual sin that can't be defeated easily in someone's life. None of us have those type things, right? You see how we're all just the same? Such persons, according to Jesus, are slaves or in bondage to sin. Such persons need inner healing. Now, please, just give me a sidebar here. This is for all of us. Please do not reject this teaching yet and say, oh, well, July 18th, he's got to be teaching about demons, you know. Can't he teach about sun? And, um, j just please allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life as I go through this? Is it really inconceivable that evil might have gained a foothold in a particular area of your life? Remember last week we mentioned that the Apostle Paul said exactly that. Speaking to the Ephesian church, he warned the believers that their sins could give the devil a foothold. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Um, and don't give the devil a foothold. So Paul is saying to the Christ followers, don't let lies, don't lose your temper, 
Because those kind of things are going to give the enemy a secure place for further progress in your life. He's going to take those footholds that he has. You know, like the wall climber who, who puts his foot securely in place and proceeds up the wall. He's going to use those little things to gain ground in your life. Okay, fourth. Let's understand this concept of strongholds, and it's in Scripture here. I'm going to read a verse from 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. It says this, For we live in a world we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish the arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Satan must have a foothold inside us so that we, because he seems to be making thoughts come into our mind that cause us to be disobedient to Christ, it seems to say. So let's define what Paul is talking about here when he's talking about we have the power to demolish strongholds. Let's understand what strongholds are. The, uh, a stronghold is a place that was set up to protect against attack. Okay? So now, if you would, it's a, complement, it's a complementary um, thing to... Uh, the word that we looked at last week that I just spoke about, footholds, okay? A stronghold is complementary to a foothold. We said that a foothold is a secure position from which Satan makes progress, okay? It's like that wall climber who puts his foot strong and then proceeds vertically up the wall. Satan takes hold of some place, he puts his foot there, and he proceeds to attack us further. It's a secure place, Whereas a stronghold is a place that Satan has set up to protect himself from the power of the cross. And he's done that inside our lives, deep inside our lives, perhaps stuck in some past memory or even just in a, in a pattern that we practice. And he must defend that foothold that he has so he builds a stronghold in our lives. Satan builds a defense against the power of the cross, thinking that he can defeat what Jesus did. Now, this word stronghold, even though it's found in 2 Corinthians, this is the only place in the New Testament it's found, but in the Old Testament, it's found 50 other, 50 other times, and, um, and 18 of those times refer to actual battles, actual places where armies set up defenses against those who were attacking. For instance, Israel attacked and conquered the land of Canaan when they came out of Egypt. However, there were still fortified or strongholds that were under the enemy's control inside the land of Canaan. Jerusalem was one of them. After the Israelites conquered Canaan, it wasn't for another 200 years before they were able to break through and conquer Jerusalem because the strongholds were tight, and that was under King David. There are good strongholds in Scripture. For instance, the Lord is actually referred to as a stronghold. In Psalm 9, verse 9, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. Listen to that. The Lord is a refuge for those who are oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. So just like there are good strongholds, there are also bad strongholds such as what Paul referred to in 2 Corinthians. And he uses those terms, as I stated, the, the term stronghold and foothold, in a complementary way in his writing because it, it refers to an area that Satan has established a position inside of our minds, inside of our thinking, inside of us that he has to defend because it's from there that he attacks us. Okay, so lastly here, let me get to... Um, let me get to this one point. What does demonization actually look like? So a, a person who is oppressed by Satan, a person who is, as I say, demonized by Satan, what, what does that look like? Well, generally, um, they look like me and you. 
They look like normal people. They look like good Christians. They look like people who don't know Christ. They, uh, Satan has and does try to demonize or oppress every human being to influence the world with evil so that he can somehow hurt God. These people are not demon-possessed. That's something deeper, something more pronounced. But you and I, everyday people in this world, are influenced by Satan and his demons in one way, shape, or form. And actually, I remember uh, learning about this and uh, speaking about it years and years and years ago. I used to say, hey, you know, Satan uh, probably isn't attacking you. It's probably one of his demons because he doesn't have, he's, he's not going to mess with me and you. Like, I mean, we're a little, we're, you know, he's out doing the big stuff, influencing nations. And, you know, uh, Satan just sends his demons to do the work on us. He'll oppose us. He'll get inside of us, and once he gets a foothold, he builds a stronghold. And he wants to put that up. But you know, as Paul said, we have the power to demolish strongholds that Satan puts up. Um, we, can, we can overcome those thoughts, those attitudes, those behaviors that he puts into our lives. Let me give you a real practical example of a person who, in Scripture, is really demonized. And this is a story in, found in Acts chapter 8. It's a story about a man named Simon. Now, Simon was, um, in his day, a sorcerer. Um, he, it was just what he did for a living. Uh, so like someone who reads tarot cards, like someone who, uh, you know, organizes seances, someone who looks at crystals and, or, or tries to predict future events, someone who tries to talk to the dead. Uh, you know, this is the kind of work sorcery that Simon was involved in. The story goes like this in Acts chapter 8. Philip goes down to Samaria from Jerusalem where Stephen was just martyred for Christ. And, and he starts preaching in Samaria the good news of Jesus and the salvation of God. And people start believing in Jesus. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard about this that happened in Samaria, they received word, and they sent John and Peter to pray for the people that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And the apostles went down, they laid their hands on Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit. Simon the sorcerer was one of them. Let's read the story a little bit. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery, in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had am amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, who came to preach the good news, as he proclaimed that good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. So Luke clearly says that Simon, this sorcerer, got saved in, a, in essence. He believed in Jesus. And the evidence seems to bear that out. He was baptized and he continued to, to travel with Philip to preach or to, to help him in his, in his uh, work. However, when Simon experienced that the apostles had come to pray and lay hands on people and people received the Holy Spirit, Simon, there was a foothold in Simon's life. There was a little stronghold, a defended place that Satan had left in Simon's life where he was you know, just a little greedy and he offered the disciples some money. for You know that thing that John and Peter are doing where they're laying hands on people and they're speaking in tongues and the Holy Spirit comes on? I want to do that. Give me, give me that. 
I'll give you some money if you give me that gift. Peter rebuked him, saying that the Holy Spirit can't be obtained that way. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are filled with bitterness and captive to sin. But this guy believed in Jesus. He was a Christ follower. He, yeah, he got saved, it says in Acts 8 a little earlier. And, and so here's really important. He's, he, he's captive to sin. In the Greek, the original word for captive here means bound together. It's the word that carried the concept of a human ligament. You know, a ligament that ties two bones together or a tendon that ties a muscle to a bone. Um, these things hold the, the parts of the body together. They are bound. They are captive to each other. And they have to be if there is going to be health in the body. For instance, my shoulder has a ripped tendon. Tendon across the top here uh, has come off from the bone, and it gets painful. It's not normal. It's not right. So this idea of being bound to or captive to sin is something that is really a strong concept. So back to the passage here. As in the original language, the word sin, so captive to sin, this word sin is can be translated and is translated in some versions of Scripture as iniquity, which in English really is sin, in modern English. Except that this word captive to sin, that word sin, has a different root meaning. It has a root meaning a condition of not being right. Whereas committing a sin, the verb, is doing something wrong, this word here that Luke writes and says, or Peter is actually saying it, he says you are captive to sin. You are bound to a condition of sinfulness. It's characterized as ongoing. The fact that it comes from this idea shows us that someone like Simon, someone like Lewis, someone like you, all of us can be captive to an ongoing sin problem in our life. And though he was a believer, Simon was still in bondage. And, and it shows it even because it says, uh, Luke says in telling the story in chapter 8, he says, people of Samaria were amazed at his doings. Uh, you know, they, they, they paid him attention. They called him a god. And what happened when he became Christian? He, he, you know, he lost all of that. That all dried up. And so Peter was probably right and says, that there's bitterness in you. And, and that little stronghold that Satan has been defending where he has a foothold of greed in your life, it has now come out. And so Simon saw that the apostles were able to lay hands on people and that little thing came up and said, oh, I want that. I'll pay you for it because I know this will get me all, those, all that attention that I had before. He was greed, he was greed motivated. These are bondages. These are things that were in his prior life that had not yet fully been given over to Christ. Okay, I, I've made my point. What does it look like when a person is demonized? A person will manifest behaviors and responses like as if they weren't Christian. Don't put up your hand too fast. How many have, can say that you do that sometime? The good news is this. We can be delivered from that. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians. We can demolish strongholds that are there. These little areas of our life where Satan 
has a foothold, we can tear them down because of what Jesus did on the cross. So let me conclude this morning with this. I want to just, uh, well, let me first make sure that I've answered that question for you. Can believers be demonized? Can we be influenced by Satan or demons? Absolutely. Yes, we can. The whole world is. Because he has dominion for a time. He has authority for a time. Again, please, don't, don't dismiss this teaching as well. You know, pastors, really, I could tell COVID's had his, its effect on pastor. He's been reading too much or, you know, thinking into things too much. No, this is, this is real spiritual warfare. If we are true disciples of Christ, we face these kind of things all the time. Please allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Next week, I'm going to make this just a little more practical, and I'm going to identify areas that need inner healing by showing how Satan uses these footholds, how he gains entrance into our life so we could put up the stronghold against him before it even happens. But this morning, I want to end with this. I'm going to ask you to sit while Katie plays in the background. We're going to ask you just to sit and to ask God a question. This is a significant question, and you need to hear God. So please, as best you can at home or here, try to, try to zone out everything else. And, and, and if you can't for some reason because there's, uh, you know, activity around you, hey, just uh, do this sometime today. While the message is still fresh on your mind, I allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you. But ask God this question or these questions. Where does Satan have footholds and strongholds in my life? Where have I been oppressed by or influenced by a demon? Again, we don't want to even acknowledge that. So asking it, kind of acknowledge it, please ask it. Because this is real. So we're just going to sit quietly for a few moments. Ask God that question. saying something to you like your temper is a stronghold of Satan or your biting criticism cruelty inclusion of lust in your life maybe he's saying that you know you, 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 you gossip or you badmouth other people maybe he's saying you're very materialistic you think more about things than about people The area that God has revealed to you, 
I really believe that's an area that needs inner healing. We're going to work through this some more in the weeks to come. Now may the power of Jesus Christ be with you. May the power of God that works in us uh, do much more than anything we could ask or imagine. And to him be glory in his church and in Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May God's name be praised in your life today. Thank you for being here, every one of you. Thank you for joining us at home. God bless you.